Thank you, Sam. Welcome. I've made a number of talks since 11, uh, excuse me, since the 11th of March of 2011, uh, following the disasters. And two of those talks, I started in the same way. If you've heard me in the past, please indulge me for using this refrain yet again. Monty Dixon and I went to the same high school. Monty Dixon, Monty's older brothers were two of my best friends. Monty, like me, studied Japanese in his high school year, university, and then after studying, he went back to Japan to teach. On the 11th of March, Monty was stationed as a JET teacher at an elementary school in Minami Sanriku. After the warning, after the earthquake and the warning bells went, he and the other teachers removed the students to the evacuation point. And then he went, per instructions, to the fifth floor of the municipal building in Minami Sanriku. You'll know that the tsunami came soon thereafter and reached the sixth floor. Monty's body was found two weeks later, four kilometers from the site. Monty was 27. I hope that's an age that resonates with some of you. 23,000 people died on the 11th of March. That kind of devastation is one that's hard to get our heads around. And yet, we must. Japan is too big, too important, and too much humanity to only be defined by the disaster. As we've seen in the past, Japan is a country that very much can be defined by the rebuilding, by the resilience, and by the enthusiasm that comes with the living culture. Today we're going to make a stab at that shortly. I think we're about 150 days, 130 days after. So we're still in early times. But we're going to, while recognizing and respecting those 23,000 people who have lost their lives, think about going forward and thinking about how Japan uh, recovers. Japan's very important to Australia. Oftentimes, that's forgotten nowadays. Japan remains the third largest economy in the world. Japan remains the second largest trading partner of Australia. Japan is Australia's key partner in a Pacific uh, security region, and the people-to-people -people links between Japan and Australia are perhaps only surpassed, if surpassed, by New Zealand. For all of those reasons, it should be keen to all policymakers as they look forward to how this relationship in this country will go forward. I actually had a paper I wanted to present, but we have so many fantastic speakers. I'm going to put that in my back pocket and where should I direct you to the East Asia Forum instead, where I've written a couple of articles that are up there. Um, so rather than take my time uh, to make the arguments again, hope you uh, visit that site. Instead, I want to, um, what we'll do is keep each speaker to about 10 minutes. We have uh, a wealth, pun intended, of economists today, um, but they're all going to be speaking a bit more broadly um, than just the economy. I'll introduce them in order as they go through, and I will be cutting them off uh, very sharply because of the limited amount of time. Our first speaker, though, is Sisera, Professor Sisera Jaya Syria. Used to, Sisera used to be the head of the Asian Economic Center at University of Melbourne, but since 2008 has been at La Trobe. Um, someone who is well known in this area, and we're really lucky to tempt him up from the cold Melbourne uh, to spend some time with us here in the, in the wonderful Canberra winter day that it is. Cicero. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure for me uh, to be invited out here to uh, meet such a uh, vibrant group of people from uh, all over the world. Um, and then to talk about one of the biggest natural disasters uh, that we have uh, seen in recent history. Um, I have a few slides that I'll try and uh, get through quickly just in order to organize uh, 
uh, my ideas. Uh, I guess all of you are familiar with what happened in Japan uh, March 11th, uh, in a huge earthquake followed by a tsunami, a bit like what happened in uh, 2004, December in Asia. Um, and the tsunami really was the most important source of destruction. Uh, massive numbers that, if you compare that with uh, uh, what happened in Japan itself in 1995, there was a major earthquake uh, in the city of Kobe, uh, but this was what happened in Kobe uh, quite substantially in, across all dimensions. Um, and very importantly, uh, unlike in most cases, it didn't end with the earthquake and the tsunami uh, because it affected uh, a major uh, nuclear power generating plant uh, at Fukushima Daiichi. And this has created problems uh, which continue until today. Uh, Now, uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, I'm an economist, uh, but I will stick to the economics, but I, uh, one thing I want to stress here is the human cost, the human tragedy of this, you can't quantify, you can't put numbers on that. Uh, also, uh, the strength and resilience shown by the Japanese community uh, in the face of the disaster, both those people, those people who are directly affected and in the neighborhoods, it's amazing again. If you compare the scenes of, uh, of what happened in Katrina during the US uh, 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 disaster some years ago, uh, when there was rioting, looting, uh, shootings, and then you compare how the Japanese people stayed in queues all the time patiently to get their little rations of water and, and, uh, and food, you see a complete contrast. Amazing uh, sense of community, uh, community strength, resilience, uh, a sense of uh, social responsibility. And that's the social capital uh, of Japan that uh, it will be using, hopefully, to build on. Now, massive, uh, the magnitude of this disaster in economic terms is really massive. I wouldn't, uh, because of the time constraint, don't want to uh, dwell on it. But this is, if you just look at what happened directly in the affected areas, it's much bigger than what happened in Kobe in 1995. Uh, but if you take the total cost, uh, that is, the effect in the directly affected areas, plus the impact on the other areas because of the economic linkages uh, between this region and other regions, then the, the total cost, uh, there are different estimates of it, uh, but could be as much as 6% of GDP, uh, very large uh, economic cost. <coughs> and this is one of the natural disasters which has had a real global uh, impact because it is the third largest economy in the world, uh, it plays a major role in world currency markets, stock markets, all of this, and in international trade. So across many dimensions, uh, there was a global impact. Uh, even though in terms of human uh, deaths and so on, the 2004 Asian tsunami was considerably bigger, uh, the economic impact on the global scene was much bigger in the case of uh, what happened in, uh, in March uh, in, in Japan. Uh, you know, some of my uh, colleagues on the panel will be speaking uh, more directly on, on in more detail on some of these aspects, including the impact on international trade. Uh, but I just want to uh, say this is, you know, just to keep a big picture perspective, it's a huge uh, uh, impact uh, both in Japan itself and globally. Uh, you know, uh, in Japan, the response was very quick. Uh, you know, people actually, uh, in Japan itself, if you go there now, a lot of people criticize what the government has done or hasn't done and so on. But the reality is, compared to other natural disasters, the, the, the response in Japan was amazingly good. Um, most uh, critical infrastructure was uh, brought back into uh, operation very soon after, uh, including the, the bullet trains, uh, the basic road network, uh, etc. But huge numbers of people had to be evacuated, and that is because of the radiation issue. 
And what is uh, happening now, uh, because I might not get uh, enough time to uh, get to the end of my presentation, what is happening now is that there's a lot of debates about how to finance reconstruction, how to move ahead uh, with issues such as nuclear energy, and uh, you know what's the forward, uh, what, what's the way forward for the Japanese uh, community? And there are big debates uh, happening in Japan at the moment, um, and to some extent, there's a degree of uh, policy deadlock and and even paralysis at some levels, uh, which is part of the tragedy, I guess. Uh, just to get one thing clear, there's a misconception spread uh, partly through the to uh, all kinds of commentators in the in the media and so on, that uh, you know Japan is a very highly indebted country uh, and that it has huge problems financing uh, the reconstruction necessary. That's a myth. Japan is not an indebted country. There's a, Japan has a government which is in debt to its own citizens. It has borrowed from its own citizens. But it is not a poor country. It's one of the most affluent countries in the world. And even after 20 years of almost zero economic growth, uh, it is a country with huge national savings. Uh, government has a debt. The government has borrowed from its own people. But as a country, no. It's, it's a net saver country. Uh, it is one of the largest, it's the second largest uh, uh, stock of uh, international savings, uh, second only to China, on a per capita basis much bigger. Uh, Japanese government debt is very high, that's true, but if you look at uh, net debt as opposed to gross debt, gross debt is what most people focus on. Again, it's large, but not uh, absolutely massive. Uh, but what has happened is, uh, so the, the, there's no real problem finding the money to finance reconstruction. Uh, it is, the debates are about you know, what are the mechanisms through which it should be financed, uh, how should they uh, undertake reconstruction, should people go back to the areas, should uh, nuclear power uh, be restored. Uh, what's the way to go? And what is dominating uh, uh, debate at the moment is the whole issue of nuclear power. Uh, Japan is highly dependent on nuclear power, um, around 30% uh, of all uh, electricity generated comes from nuclear. Um, and until last year, until this uh, disaster, Japan was really looking forward to going even more nuclear. This is the strategic uh, energy plan of Japan. Right. Um, you know, they were planning to get to 50% nuclear by 2030. Um, and now we have got a huge crisis. Uh, we find that uh, safety measures were inadequate. Uh, there have been corrupt practices, attempts at cover-up, regulatory failure. And the government and, and, and the nuclear power industry have been very cozy. And this, is, this has really created uh, a, a lot of uh, issues. Um, one minute. So at the moment, uh, the nuclear power issue dominates. The government itself is weak uh, uh, politically. It doesn't. Uh, it, it's a coalition which is split, and, and the, the, the majority party in power itself is split uh, into different factions. Uh, public confidence in politicians has become very low, partly because of the nuclear thing, but it has been growing for a while for other reasons as well. And there are issues about government spending. Government needs to spend, but there have been huge amount of waste to spending in the past, uh, including this term, um, bridges to nowhere. They were building bridges to go nowhere. Uh, so once, one. Thing. Uh, so long-term recovery in Japan, 20 years of economic stagnation, uh, so far two lost decades. Uh, and what is really important in Japan is to get people to spend. Uh, but what the, the nuclear, what the, this disaster has done is it has shaken confidence further. Consumer uh, confidence is down. So spending is down, and people are worried about government spending, that this might also be wasteful and might not get, get you anywhere. 
So what is happening is that we are getting uh, to a situation where well beyond the, uh, the actual disaster and reconstruction, the broader issue of Japanese economic recovery uh, may be delayed even further. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as he said, um, I was a student on the first year of the uh, this any Japanese Greek study. Back then, there was a um, academics actually you know running through this program, which you can imagine you know KLB, you know program one of the program. But now I see uh, this year student you know um, running smoothly, so it's you know, good. You know, I think that's <laughs> and especially you know when I came to this morning to the airport, you know Brody you know came and came to the airport and pick us up and you know. <laughs> I'm sure you, you learn much more um, uh, in, this, uh, in, this pro- uh, in this program. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, um, impact of the uh, what they call in Japan the March 11th um, earthquake on Japan's trade and the foreign investment. So Japanese uh, firms investing to overseas. This is sort of in line with the, my, what I do in my research uh, project. So um, in, in this presentation, I just sort of divide into you know sort of uh, immediate impact or short run impact on trade and investment on Japan, and the break up into sort of uh, medium or long term perspective on uh, impact on trade in FDI for for Japan, and I just for the uh, smaller uh, pr- um, breaking up the uh, group discussion group, I just want to impose uh, one question at the end. So what is the immediate impact on, on international trade on Japan? As, as you saw um, some of the newspaper and news, um, you know, there's you know, hugely, especially general manufacturing, hugely um, affected. <coughs> um, not, not only um, Japanese ma- manufacturing itself affected it globally, you see some story, uh, news story um, telling, you know, US, because Japanese uh, a supplier of the parts and components was a short of supply parts and components coming from Japan. The autom- you know, automobile production in US, Europe, and has to be stopped for, for some time. So Japan played quite a big role as an exporter of the um, of the uh, providing parts and components or the motor vehicle, electronics, electronics, and computers, laptops, maybe some parts of uh, coming from Japan. So what 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 happened after this, you know, um, earthquake? Um, this whole production of inside Japan sort of, you know, came to came to halt for for a uh, couple of weeks. And now, uh, now uh, only this month is they started to resuming food production of this, you know, uh, big automobile, uh, automobile maker, Toyota, Nissan in Japan. So it has in, it, it has huge impact on you know global uh, manufacturing. Um, uh, it disruption because of shortage of supplying uh, parts and compo- key parts and components from Japan, and this was hugely felt, uh, strongly felt not only Japan but regional economy as well. And the, you know, you you come to the question why this is you know uh, such huge impact on regional production process. That's because uh, nowadays um, you know you don't see any, especially motor car electronics production. <coughs> It doesn't. It doesn't happen from you know start to start to end. It doesn't happen within one country, but it's sort of <coughs> whole production process spread around in, in a in a in a in different country within the region. I give I give one example. Do you know a company called Boeing's? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know where it's from? Austria. U.S. And do you know what they produce? What they manufacture? Huh? Yeah, fine. Yeah. And would you call that, you know, Boeing's airplane, it's made in U.S.? No? What, what do you call it? Where is it made from? What is it manufactured? Huh? Japan? Um, <laughs> actually, uh, actually uh, bits and bits coming from all over the world. So this is sort of breakdown of the airplane of the uh, Boeing uh, 787. Look how many countries involved is producing this one jet. Uh, US, Canada, Austria, Japan, Korea, and some country Europe. 
Um, so what we call, what we economists call uh, the value added. Most of value added production coming from out of the US. They, they do assembling in, in Boeing in US, but several com companies, several countries getting involved. Okay? So you see um, modern globalization world, uh, manufacturing <coughs> production, it, does, it just doesn't happen in one country, but just spread around you know, many different countries. And the Japan quite, uh, play quite a significant role. So, for example, for this Boeing uh, new 7A7 Dreamliner, Japanese company, they uh, provide um, 35% 30, 30, of the value added going to this airplane. So that's an example. Um, for example, uh, about one-fifth of the world's semiconductor is produced by Japanese firm in Japan, and 40% of the electric component is produced also in, by Japanese firm. So some market analysts may make a remark that Japan, if you go higher, higher up in the market share of the value chain, you see, you see Japanese company. So what happened in the uh, so disruption of the manufacturing in northern part of the Japan? So there's uh, many many world class manufacturer. They are they are in the, uh, they couldn't produce car or Boeing because of you know shortage supply from from Japan. So that was that was imposing some some problem for us and the. What we can, what we so as taking as an issue, what we can discuss about the future. So, what is going to, what is the impact on the uh, medium term, long term business strategy for Japan and for Japanese company? So, as you might heard, um, Japanese <coughs> firm, especially Toyota, inventing this. Uh, this is what is called uh, just-in-time logistics. So this, you know, production process, you know, regional production from from uh, parts and components produced in Japan go to Malaysia, China, and bits and pieces, you know, get together, go to U.S. Final goods assembled, as in ship exported from China to to U.S. And they have, you know, quite cleverly, um, and you know, configured and and uh, to reduce, um, you know, extra uh, inventory. But just in time, logistic has a problem itself, and it's quite sensitive to you know um, unexpected supply shock. So that now the discussion now is whether a Japanese firm or Japanese company is going to uh, reconsidering this just in time logistics. And the much more you know lingering question is the location Japanese uh, uh, company from uh, northern part. Well, actually, some, some happen from northern part to south of Japan, but there's a uh, power problem happening in Japan. And the few firms... Um, so this is, a, this is a question I want to ask the audience. Will this disruption of the production process, you know, what's happening, with, with encouraging more Japanese farming to go into out of, you know, move away from out of Japan? Um, that's a question I want to ask, and the uh, so I'm quite optimistic um, about this. You know, falling out of you know, there's a you know, quite debate, hotly debated discussion in 1990, but they might come back again. And there's um, some you know, um, some people say um, you know, confidence in Japan as a reliable, uh, reliable supply of key, key parts and components has have quite quite shaken. And um, you know, unrelated to unrelated to this uh, uh, disruption on the last week, you know, Japanese farm already going overseas. But I'm quite optimistic about this uh, move away from you know move away from Japan, and we can discuss in the discussion. <laughs> um, I have a longer paper, and if anybody is interested, you can find it on the site that's on the screen now, um, Asia Rights. Um, I'm going to reduce it enormously in order to get into this 10 minutes. And what I'm going to do is maybe a little bit different from the other speakers. Um, I'm going to be quite micro 
and I want to focus particularly on the Fukushima nuclear accident issue, uh, mainly because it's still happening um, and because I think there are really important things that should be being done right now in Japan and aren't being done, and I'll come to those in a moment. Um, so one of the important things is this is not something that happened on the 11th of March 2011, it's something that's still happening now. And according to the relatively optimistic scenario put forward by the Fukushima nuclear plant operators, TEPCO, uh, essentially the accident will go on happening until January next year. By January next year, they hope to have it <coughs> under control and be able to move on to the next step, which is moving towards decommissioning um, the reactors, which is in itself an enormously long, difficult um, an expensive process. That's, if all goes well, it will be done by January next year, um, but at the moment there is also a very dangerous, risky process going on of keeping the reactors cool without causing nuclear water to flood out of the reactor system. Um, and that could break down, there have been a new, numerous minor breakdowns already. Meanwhile, so far, Nine workers at the Fukushima nuclear power plant dealing with the cleanup are known to have been exposed to over 250 millisieverts of radiation. I have learned about millisieverts in the last four months or so, like most of my friends in Japan. That's a lot of radiation. That is about um, 12, more than 12 times the upper annual limit for nuclear workers in Germany. Um, of them, at least two have been exposed to doses more than 30 times the upper limit for the workers. Now, in a disaster of this magnitude, the irradiation of nine workers might not sound all that bad, really. But one of the alarming facts is that we know that these workers have been exposed to that level of radiation because their radiation levels have been properly monitored. As of mid-June, there were about 1,400 workers brought in to help with the clean-up whose radiation levels hadn't been properly monitored, so we don't know what level of radiation they've been exposed to. <coughs> Even more surprisingly to me, there were or are um, at least 60 workers who were brought in to help with the clean-up, and nobody can follow up their health situation because nobody recorded their names and addresses properly. Um, that reflects the fact that some of these people are recruited from the kind of day labour system in Japan. They are the latest in what are known as um, the nuclear gypsies in Japan. Um, 80,000 people have been evacuated from the 20 kilometre danger zone, Keikai Kuki, around the Fukushima nuclear plant. Uh, voluntary evacuations of those living in radiation hotspots further away from the plant are now going on. And some people suggest that as many as 70,000 more people will need to be evacuated. Uh, the first detailed survey of radiation levels in Namiyamachi, which is one of the towns that straddles the uh, danger zone, was carried out about three months after the accident. And that was just because everybody was so busy with everything else that they had to deal with. And what it showed was something that we know about nuclear radiation. It doesn't spread out evenly from the centre. It kind of pools in hot spots. So some of the places really near to the plant don't have very high radiation levels. Some places quite a long way away do. This was Namiyamachi kind of in happier times. Um, this is um, Akogi, which is part of Namiyamachi. And that's one of the hot spots. It has radiation levels which over a year would probably be about eight times the level that nuclear workers in Germany are allowed to be exposed to. And that's a problem if you're a child because radiation has much more serious effects on children. So what does all of this mean for people living around the nuclear plant in Fukushima Pre Prefecture? And it's mostly Fukushima Prefecture, the eastern side that's affected. The answer to that question is nobody knows. And that's really the thing that I find most troubling. Um, human beings have the ability to release the power of atomic fission, but we don't yet have the scientific knowledge to determine the effects of low to medium levels of radiation on human health. 
25 years after the Chernobyl disaster, nobody knows how many people died or will die, because some are still dying, as a result of that disaster. Plausible estimates range from a low of about 9,000 people to a high of about 90,000. You'll find estimates outside on both sides of the scale, but that's a fairly, you know, those are, that's a range that a lot of scientists can think. Um, now, of course, the amount of radiation released from the Fukushima plant is a lot less than Chernobyl. It's about 14%, 1.4%. So you could do a crude extrapolation from, say, the 9,000 figure and get a figure of possibly about 1,200 deaths from radiation in Japan over a long period. But, of course, you can't do that because nobody knows if the 9,000 figure is correct and you can't extrapolate directly to Japan because there are many differences between the two places. Um, of course, what we do know is that many people uh, in Chernobyl suffered greatly from the process of evacuation, the social effects of the disaster, particularly older people. And that is going to be true in Fukushima. So, to put it in practical terms, um, if you live in Apogi or similar areas, um, and you go to the experts and you say, what should I do? Should I give up my community, my house, my job? Should I move my kids to another school? And of course, I won't be able to sell my house because nobody's going to buy it. I might not be able to get another job. My kids may be shunned by their classmates in other parts of Japan because they're seen as being radioactive. If you ask the experts, the answer is search us. We have no idea what this is going to do to your health. You've got to make the decision. Basically, that's the answer you get. Um, there are, of course, a whole lot of other issues. There's the issue of uh, radioactivity, particularly radioactive cesium, entering the food chain, and that is affecting areas of Japan further away. There's also radioactive cesium, which has a half-life of 30 years, entering the sewage system over northeastern Japan. Um, and that's kind of on top of the radiation that people absorb from the air around them. Now, the levels of radiation in places like Tokyo and so on are not actually much above background radiation at the moment. Um, but the food issue is significant, possibly. Um, and certainly in eastern Fukushima, the radiation levels are possibly quite significant. The evacuation zone around the Chernobyl nuclear plant um, was known after the accident in 1986 as Zona Vitugenia, which means the zone of alienation. And I think that's sorry, I think that's a remarkably um, evocative term. So I'm just going to go up one, even though it's time. Because I'm not sure of that. This is uh, the town nearest to the nuclear plant. Um, it's time, but I just wanted to say one thing at the end. And that is, um, there are things that should be doing, being done now around the Fukushima plant, particularly not just the Japanese government, but the World Health Community, the World, the World Health Organization, should be coming in and monitoring people's health and doing epi epidemiological studies of the effect of radiation, because that's the best way to help the people on the ground and to increase our scientific knowledge of the effects of radiation. That's not happening yet. The, gov the Japanese government struggling with this, but it's a huge task. So I think, you know, I'd like to end with a lot of support of the world community that there's much more that should be being done about this. Um, and if I have to give you a question to discuss, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask the really basic question. As students, in Australia, or maybe from somewhere else, if you come from somewhere else, are the things that you should be doing to help Japan, help people in Japan get back on track. Thank you. Well, hello. Um, I haven't had an opportunity yet to be involved very much with, um, with the program because there are so many conferences going on across the campus that um, some of us are running between different ones, although I did get to see some of you at the... Uh, Welcome, Dream. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, and because of running back and forth between conferences, I haven't put together a PowerPoint slide, but, you know, I'm an economist, and mostly what economists do with PowerPoint is so dreary. <laughs> 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 You're probably 
So let me just throw out some ideas for you and then leave you to go away and, and think about them. Um, I, I'm a macroeconomist, you know, so I'm sort of interested in what's the big picture likely to be as a result of, um, of the earthquake and the nuclear disaster that followed. When we had panels on this um, in March, just after the events, I think most macroeconomists were um, sanguine, let's say, not optimistic, but at least were saying, look, the scale of this event is not, in macroeconomic terms, and I'm not now talking about the, the um, humanitarian <coughs> issues, which are very severe, but in macro terms, it doesn't look like such a big shock that it's going to set uh, Japan back a great deal. Um, I think that the consensus view has evolved slightly since then, since March. Things are in some ways more optimistic and in some ways more pessimistic. So um, the more optimistic side is that production has actually come back on stream more rapidly than people expected in March. Um, and so recent government uh, surveys about how much of productive capacity has been put back in place um, suggest that most industries are fairly optimistic that by the end of the summer, something like 90% of, of industries think that by the end of the summer they're going to be back on track. And I, I'm not sure how much of this has been covered already. No? Okay. I um, apologise for coming in a bit late. So... Um, what, what has been remarkable is that the rebuilding of just of productive capacity or at the relocation of it in a way that was stored functioning to, uh, to production has been carried out more rapidly than, than people had feared. There is, there is about a 10% um, 10 percent of the manufacturing and service sectors mostly manufacturing, that were affected are still thinking that it will take them possibly a year to get back to speed, but it's a, that's a small share. Um, now, what that means is that the estimates for where Japan's growth will be have improved for the year 2011. So most people thought that there'd probably be a bit of a negative effect on growth in 2011. Most estimates have now gone higher than they were in April. So um, most of the estimates are now in the range of, and I say this, this, some of these figures come from a government presentation that uh, I listened to a couple of weeks ago in Tokyo. And for those of you who want to see the slides, they're available on a conference website uh, that I can refer you to. So estimates for growth forecasts for the present fiscal year, 2011, are now around about 1.6% per year. So the Bank of Japan, the OECD, the IMF have all increased their, their uh, forecasts of the growth rate. And indeed, that's been borne out by real performance in the most recent quarter. But they have also downgraded their forecasts for next year. So there are some dampening factors that are going to kick in, and by next year probably growth will be maybe between one and a half and two percent, probably lower than two. Um, so now, what does that mean overall? Well, it partly means that Japan is um, it's obviously doing better than it was just after the global financial crisis, when growth fell was in negative territory. But it does mean that Japan is still in that rather low growth scenario that it has been struggling with on and off for 20 years. And while there are always short-term factors that help explain that, what's really critical is what's happening to the underlying productivity growth of the Japanese economy. Because the longer you're growing more slowly than the potential of your economy, the more likely it is that you're undermining and sort of wasting the capacity that your economy has to generate growth. So you actually lose productive capacity the longer you're away from potential. And that comes because new capital investment doesn't take place. 
and it comes because people are unemployed, they lose skills, and so on. So there's a slight danger that every time there's one of these shocks that keeps Japan at 1.5% growth instead of 25 or 3 that that prolongs the period before you get back to productive potential. There are two other things that I throw out as being worth thinking about for the economy. One is what's going to happen to energy. I mean, obviously, the big question now is, uh, what's the future of the nuclear industry in Japan, and what are the alternatives? So um, the future for the nuclear industry in Japan, I think, now looks considerably more uh, doubtful than it did even immediately after the, the events. Immediately after, everybody was you know, full of, we've got to get on and, and be energetic and optimistic and do things. Now what we've seen, of course, is that as plants have been closed down in order to check their safety, local communities are fighting very strongly against opening them up again. Now, since 30% of Japan's energy comes from the nuclear sector, that's a very big chunk of your power generation that you have to find from somewhere else. Well, what are the alternatives for Japan? Alternative energy, green energy, that kind of um, you know, solar, hydro, all of those things, have pretty much been pushed to their currently feasible limits already. Japan has done quite a lot. Okay. So there's not a lot of, of action that can come from that. Those who are advising the government on this in Japan are saying, realistically, this means Japan is going to switch more heavily into fossil fuels as a source of energy. There will be a greater reliance on coal and oil as a source of energy. And that comes with a bunch of problems. It's uh, it's adding to global pressure on prices. This is a period when prices of these uh, fuels is rising. And it's obviously uh, has implications for climate and environment. So one thing that we have to ask ourselves, I mean, this may be temporarily good news for Australia. We we'll buy some of these things from Australia. But, you know, there will be an issue about uh, Japan facing things like carbon tax. Will that become a debate in Japan? So I suggest to you that you start thinking about uh, what are the alternative energy futures for Japan and what do they mean. The final one is uh, fiscal policy. Uh, we, all, we all said Japan can afford to pay for this, but it's beginning to look less comfortable for Japan to be able to pay for this. Um, and that might mean that interest rates do begin to go up because you have to borrow to pay for this, and that might mean that exchange rates go up. So in addition to the other risks that Nobel has mentioned, I think there is probably upward pressure on the um, on exchange rate, and just a very slight increase in the risk that Japan becomes part of another global financial crisis where you can't finance government borrowing. It's a very small risk, but it's, it's slightly more than it costs. I'll start with you. My presentation has become shorter and shorter as the other presentations have gone on because these guys have said pretty well everything that I would want to say. Uh, so what I'm going to say is reinforce uh, some of the things that they've already said, but perhaps bring, bring out some uh, other aspects, some of the dynamic, uh, that were social behavioural aspects of the response uh, to the earthquake. And I know that a lot of you are going to be suffering PowerPoint deprivation because Jenny didn't put up a PowerPoint. So I'm going to put up a PowerPoint uh, and I'm going to flash through it very quickly because, as I said, many of the points have already been made. Getting uh, the Tohoku thing in perspective is what the first two presentations did. Uh, it's a huge thing. Uh, uh, it's a huge thing in terms of a human uh, and uh, physical de devastation. Uh, of course, the tsunami impact is much bigger than the earthquake impact. Uh, this thing, uh, as many of you will know, uh, had its biggest effect on human life through the tsunami. Over 90%, 92% of the casualties in the earthquake were a consequence of the tsunami. And to make you guys all feel good and me feel a little bit uncomfortable, over 60% of the casualties were over 65 years old. So it really 
hit old people who couldn't run very fast or couldn't climb the stairs very quickly. Uh, it was a pretty devastating effect on older communities uh, in Torpoku. It was a triple disaster, and it's important to emphasise the three-pronged nature of the disaster. And as others have said, uh, the longer-term impact of the disaster really feeds through the Fukushima nuclear power station thing. Uh, I've got 13 graduates uh, in TEPCO uh, power, power company. Uh, one of them, the first one we had under the training program we have with TEPCO and the ANU uh, came at the beginning of the big trade in energy resources, gas in particular between Australia and Japan. And he is now one of the eight managing directors uh, of uh, TEPCO, uh, responsible for the import of all the fuels, uranium, gas, coal, oil and the lot, uh, for the TEPCO company. Uh, and I've talked to him since the crisis. I should say, of course, as you can imagine, uh, the company is visibly shocked. The personnel in the company are visibly shaken. My friend, who's quite a young man, really uh, has aged considerably in the last few months, as you can imagine. The responsibility of what they have to deal with is enormous. Uh, among the most costly natural disasters in history, not the biggest, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Sichuan earthquake in China uh, recently, the uh, Tanshan earthquake in China, uh, much bigger in terms of loss of human life and all the rest of it. But Kobe was the biggest, most costly one uh, uh, until this one, and this one, as Nobu and, and Cicero have said, is now the most costly. Uh, the scale of the Fukushima accident uh, as... Um, uh, 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 has been said, uh, is also uh, still unfolding. Uh, we haven't got a complete bead on it. So that's not, not a thing that we can actually uh, get into quantitative perspective yet. Uh, and I want to come back to that in a moment in terms of its impact on, on where Japan goes next. Uh, and compared with the great Hanshin earthquake, uh, the one in Kobe, uh, uh, the uh, a Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami and so on uh, uh, is bigger, uh, but in fact it impacted on a much smaller uh, part of the Japanese economy. Uh, it's bigger mainly because of the impact on energy uh, and nuclear power in particular. And of course, as Kent reminded us, for all of us who have long associations with Japan, had a deep personal impact. I'm sure there are a few of us who didn't have friends involved in the earthquake in some way or other about whom we had many anxieties for some time. Uh, trying to get uh, March the 11th uh, in perspective then, in proportion, is what I'm on about. But I think it's useful because I don't know what, what it was like for you from other parts of the world than Australia, but one of the indications of the depth of the relationship, the automatic attention we give to Japan and Australia now, was the extent to which people on, in Australian communities and households everywhere in Australia uh, watched the thing unfold and were uh, mesmerised, I suppose, and shocked by the thing as it unfolded on television and radio in Australia. It was sort of non-stop. And as somebody who's actively participating in the country on these things, of course, the extent to which you were pressured to be engaged in that uh, through that process was quite amazing. So it's useful to throw up a few slides which basically just remind us of what the enormity and scale of. I don't think you understand it until you sort of stood in it. Uh, and this is a sort of long distance way of standing in it. Uh, these uh, pictures of the, the devastation and the recovery uh, and of course the unexpected consequences of the Fukushima thing and the impact on energy uh, in Japan uh, are just visual images of, of what it all meant. Uh, how does Tohoku compare? I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this because that's been dealt with very nicely by the first two panellists. So I'll skip through these things very quickly and come to the last presentation, <laughs> managing the aftermath. Uh, and what I want to say a few words about is the psychological effect of the disaster. I mean personal psychological effect is quite profound. Uh, if you go to Japan now, as you know, I've done... Frequently, I'll be going there next week again. Uh, Jenny's been and, uh, and Tess has been and so on. Uh, one of the things, of course, that's, that's palpable uh, is the sense there is not only of being part of a fairly long funeral, and that's part of it, but also the sense there is of 
unstated anxiety uh, about uh, these things and what they mean. Uh, the sense that even in Tokyo, which could a really big shop, uh, in Tokyo you're sort of uh, living on borrowed time. There's that psychological impact is there. And it's a social thing, it's a personal thing, but it's also a social thing. And inevitably impacts upon social, even policy uh, thinking and behaviour and so on. And it relates to all aspects of this, especially the nuclear aspect of it and how that will be managed over time and how it plays in to the political process and the policy process uh, in Japan. So the nuclear power and energy uh, conundrum is the biggest thing confronting Japan today. Uh, and it's now feeding in directly to the political process, not just the management of the whole disaster, and especially the Tepco fukushima disaster, but now how Japanese politics is going to be played out. We've got political leaders standing up. Mahara, the day before yesterday, stood up, essentially, and said <coughs> we've got to contemplate a non-nuclear future for Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that the polls suggest uh, that there are uh, more than a majority of uh, uh, the electorate that uh, believe in uh, transition to a non-nuclear future. And this is a huge thing if it ever is going to be affected, uh, certainly if it's going to be affected reasonably quickly. Uh, my friends in TEPCO tell you very quickly, you can get gas fired power capacity and coal fired power capacity up quickly to deal with the immediate impacts of the crisis because those things run at about 50% of capacity all the time so you can fire them up to generate more electricity to cover the immediate gap from nuclear and so on but actually getting much further than that uh, in terms of putting in place the capacity to bring in natural gas and so on they're at limit now so you have to bring a big tanker full of natural gas into Tokyo every day if you fire the whole place up with natural gas to capacity. Uh, so there's a limit to it. And getting that capacity in place, it doesn't take six months, it doesn't take uh, uh, one year, it takes ten years or so. All these things have a sort of gestation period of five to ten years. And my friend here is getting nervous, so I'll just conclude with a few other remarks and take another minute and then... <laughs> and then finish up. So the thing raised a lot of questions about Japan-style crisis management. Uh, what it showed was the strengths of that, but what it also showed were the weaknesses of dealing with unexpected events, uh, dealing with, in a strategic way with unexpected events, and that, that is the management of the Fukushima thing, although there are some fantastic lessons about how at the grassroots uh, Japanese ingenuity and Japanese uh, cussedness responded to the management of that crisis in a way that overthrew all the weaknesses of the systems of governance in Japan. At the plant in Fukushima, the guy who was pouring seawater, seawater in the plant was told, sort of vaguely from above, that he shouldn't be pouring seawater in there because there's a possibly bad catalytic reaction, as you know, if you're a nuclear scientist, to pouring seawater into one of these things. Uh, and uh, essentially took no notice of that and said, well, if they're sort of vaguely thinking that they might stop seawater uh, pouring seawater into this, you tell them to come out here and pour the, and not pour seawater in it, I'll, I'll leave the sea. And he kept on pouring seawater into it and, of course, uh, saved, uh, uh, saved Japan from an even more disastrous nuclear crisis than we presently have. Uh, the important and final things I want to say really are that there are quite significant uh, impacts of this thing on Japanese government and politics. Uh, and uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, how that pans out over the next, uh, even the next uh, six to nine months or so, will be really fascinating to watch. Uh, and uh, uh, it all has to do with the psychology of nervousness and anxiety about the management of nuclear plants. It has to do with the way in which Japan responded uh, to the crisis, not only domestically, but you know, contrast this with Kobe when the government was frozen in terms of sending the troops in, there was no basis upon which to send the troops in, they all, uh, dealing with the situation in a decisive way, this crisis was managed extremely well. Uh, but also uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, how to deal with the Fukushima thing and, and how uh, to respond uh, to the relationship between the government and the private company uh, and uh, uh, the bureaucracy in dealing with that. And the final thing uh, to ask is a question that Kent has asked, uh, draw him into the conversation so he feels a part of this and he doesn't want to get me off the stage. Uh, 
is whether or not this whole thing means some sort of decisive watershed in Japanese affairs. Uh, one sense, well, it's got to mean something in terms of the way in which Japan managed itself down the track, and it does. But in another sense, I think I, I share Ken's view that really it reinforces some of the traditional sort of values, institutions and strengths of Japanese society, of which Japan can be extremely proud, which, which stood Japan in extremely good st- sense as it was faced with this crisis. And, and that really is what ultimately shines through uh, in the management of the crisis. Uh, and so what we have is a reinforcement of the competence, resilience and order that characterises Japanese society, a testament that is to the fortitude of the Japanese people, Japanese institutions and traditions, and that's a reinforcing thing. So that's a positive aspect, a positive outcome of the crisis, despite all the nervousness and anxiety that persists because of its impact at an individual level and a social level and at a big uh, sort of national uh, security level all around. The final thing is that really what this crisis did, uh, quite differently from the Corbett crisis too, was show how connected Japan has become with the international community. Uh, when Corbett happened, there was a, an incredible shyness about allowing foreigners to come in to help. It was an immediate response to bring foreign help in. The relationship between Japan and the United States uh, through the security dimension of the response to the crisis has become stronger. At the same time, as uh, Nobu has shown us very clearly, the links uh, with the international economic community and the international community through the economics has become stronger too. So in one sense... Uh, this thing has reinforced or intensified the policy schizophrenia in Japan's foreign policy, uh, which sees you know, uh, the links with the US through the security community and the links with China through the economic community uh, thrown into highlight once again in the management uh, of this crisis, as it is in highlight in the management of everyday affairs in Japan. Thank you, Peter. Um, I was going to make a couple of extra comments, but I think Peter picked them up. Uh, But just to make sure that when we go into questions, they're not lost. Also recognize we've had an economic emphasis, but recognize the political dimensions. And we now have a prime minister who has said he will step down um, on the basis of, of an interesting coalition. And the second is, for Australia, the security relationships. The fact that the self-defense forces were able to deploy, as Peter said, within five minutes and the cooperation with the United States has given a re, uh, a refound um, sense of the role that the SDF, the self-defense forces, might play in Japan and the cooperation with the United States. So uh, politics and security are two different dimensions. I want to get you out to lunch, or excuse me, to tea by 2.40. I think that gives me about five minutes for questions, and then we'll break into groups. And I think most of the speakers will be circulating among the groups. But um, just a five minutes worth of questions uh, if you want to take this plenary session. But your first, second, third, and that's it. <laughs> yes, please. I've called on you. Uh, I have a question to Prof. Peter Dresden. Uh, so it's a wonderfully fascinating lecture. I really like the way that you use several words on psychology because I would uh, especially appreciate that because I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, but I could understand uh, the, the uses of the word uh, that you have used here in the last sentence that it intensified foreign policy schizophrenia. By schizophrenia, what do you mean? mean uh, paranoia or something else? No, not apparent at all. But, uh, the difficulty uh, situation in Japan and many other countries in the region is put in, in terms of uh, the relationships, the uh, security relationships with the United States and the very powerful economic relationships with uh, China. And marrying those two things together is difficult uh, because uh, uh, China is a security challenge, potentially, for Japan at the same time. Uh, Without the deep interconnections economically with China, uh, the Japanese economy wouldn't be the strong economy, even though it's got a few weaknesses in terms of growth performance, wouldn't be the strong and internationally competitive economy that it is today. Over 40% of the output of Japanese manufacturing firms is produced in Asia, most of it in China. And that's what makes them, of course, so internationally competitive. This following out process that Nomu mentioned is key to that. Uh, the, the 
uh, uh, putting uh, capacity off sh offshore so it goes to competitive locations, drawing in supplies and components, reprocessing and so on, assembling elsewhere. That's the strength of the Japanese production system internationalized. And of course, it's deeply linked in with China and Asia. So uh, you can't have a friend only of the United States for security purposes or a friend only of China for economic purposes. Uh, the two things are there. How you manage that politically uh, is what I call a sort of schizophrenic problem. OK, so we're going to do the last two speakers. I'm going to ask you not to put all of the preparatory thank you very much. That was the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and I'm going to ask the respondents to keep it really short and sharp. So there was one here in the middle. Uh, hi, I'm going to um, quote Ken Addison um, in my question. Um, you said you were, sorry. In that case, you can go on as long as you Yeah, you said a lot of commentators have uh, made, and you thought this was a mistake to um, this very bad natural disaster and build a narrative around it, um, and perhaps this is a mistake. Um, but I've been noticing like the, the traditionally apathetic Japanese views they've been really re-energized by this disaster with volunteerism and like politi no, traditionally politi very politically apathetic but um, they've really been trying to help those who have been affected by the disaster. So do you see perhaps that this is this earthquake has an, and tsunami has been the job start that Japanese youths need to engage with um, uh, Japanese in the political scene, or um, is it just an aberration? So I'll make a very quick response, but then turn to Tessa. Um, so my quick response is, um, I disagree with the traditional analysis that says Japan's apathetic. I think at the local level, Japan has always said will remain very active and engaged, but it's been very localized. It's just now that we see that um, spring to a higher level. But Tessa. It's a question. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, um, similar to Kent, I mean, I think that what's come out of the disaster has been some amazing activity at the local level. Local communities responding absolutely <coughs> remarkably, and often young people, as you said, being in the chance. I think there's a huge disjunction between that and national politics. And at the same time that that's happening, there's been intense and increasing disillusionment about national politics. And the really interesting thing to see is going to be how that divide plays out, this energy, energy at the local level, but the disillusionment about the national political system. Last question. Uh, my question is about uh, um, whether the um, disaster is going to change Japan's foreign policy. And uh, as Dr. Yamashita um, talked about Japan's heavy reliance on nuclear power. However, the public's confidence in the safety of nuclear energy is seriously shaken. And uh, um, and also Professor uh, Jenny Corbett mentioned that uh, Japan will have to turn to oil and uh, coal as a substitute. Um, but uh, um, I'm wondering whether this will make Japan to adopt a more aggressive foreign policy so as to compete for more strategic interests in the world. Uh, Professor Yamashita? Yeah. So um, I'm just um, answering this kind of part of your question. Um, so <coughs> we, uh, I'm also, I was my Japan, you know, um, I know how people, you know, normal people feel like nuclear, you know, apart from everything. Uh, so we, we are sort of uh, have a belief that, you know, this uh, nuclear, you know, energy thing is quite safe, you know. So this is what happened to talk with you, this uh, an extraordinary event, you know, nobody could, you know, had a, had a, you know, imagine, you know, how, how the effect of the tsunami and you know, devastating you could find. But, you know, if you go back in the history of the Japanese energy policy, so Japan as a country doesn't have any, you know, natural resources, you know, even unlike in Australia. So we always, you know, have to depend on the foreign country to, to provide us the energy. And we sort of didn't like, you know, if you, if you look at trade statistics, you know, like 60%, uh, you know, huge amount of the uh, oil come from, from overseas. And, you know, the oil show happened, you know, in 70. And the Japanese government, also people like to have, you know, safe reliance on this, you know, uh, uh, power, power problem. That's why this, you know, uh, grand scheme on this nuclear power uh, station 
and can be too. Um, but we, we always have a belief that this is you know very very safe you know uh, way of you know generating energy. And now what happened after you know on March 11th, um, people also government is convinced that now we have to move away from nuclear uh, energy. And you know I was in Japan two weeks two weeks ago and they you know commented that discussing about how about we have you know nuclear energy you know underground. You know, that's just a uh, you know, very meeting with the body that's not the problem. And the obviously government trying to do uh, renewable, you know, energy. That's something Jenny has mentioned. So for 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 me I think you know next 10, 10 to twenty years we still have to rely on these nuclear power things, but um, eventually, you know, uh, my kids or my grandkids, you know, children's generation in a similar world if you know renewable energy. So unfortunately, I'm going to call it there. Please join me in thanking the speakers.